Book Three, Part One, from the Republic by Plato, read by Bob Neufeld. Such then, I said, are our principles of theology. Some tales are to be told, and others are not to be told to our disciples from their youth upwards, if we mean them to honor the gods and their parents and to value friendship with one another. Yes, and I think that our principles are right," he said. But if they are to be courageous, must they not learn other lessons besides these, and lessons of such a kind as will take away the fear of death? Can any man be courageous who has the fear of death in him? Certainly not, he said. And can he be fearless of death, or will he choose death in battle rather than defeat and slavery, who believes the world below to be real and terrible? Impossible. Then we must assume a control over the narrators of this class of tales as well as over the others, and beg them not simply to revile, but rather to commend the world below, intimating to them that their descriptions are untrue, and will do harm to our future warriors. That will be our duty, he said. Then, I said, we shall have to obliterate many obnoxious passages, beginning with the verses, I would rather be a serf on the land of a poor and portionless man than rule over the dead who have come to naught. We must also expunge the verse, which tells us how Pluto feared, lest the mansions grim and squalid which the gods abhor should be seen both of mortals and immortals. And again, O oh heavens, verily in the house of Hades there is soul and ghostly form, but no mind at all. Again of Tiresias. To him even after death did Persephone grant mind that he alone should be wise, but the other souls are flitting shades. Again, the soul flying from the limbs had gone to Hades, lamenting her fate, leaving manhood and youth. Again, and the soul, with shrilling cry, passed like smoke beneath the earth. And, as bats in hollow a mystic cavern, whenever any of them has dropped out of the string and falls from the rock, fly shrilling and cling to one another, so did they with shrilling cry hold together as they moved. And we must beg Homer and the other poets not to be angry if we strike out these and similar passages, not because they are unpoetical or unattractive to the popular ear, but because the greater the poetical charm of them, the less are they meet for the ears of boys and men who are meant to be free, and who should fear slavery more than death. Undoubtedly. Also we shall have to reject all the terrible and appalling names which describe the world below, Cocytus and Styx, Ghost under the Earth, and Sapless Shades, and any similar words of which the very mention causes a shudder to pass through the inmost soul of him who hears them. I do not say that these horrible stories may not have a use of some kind, but there is a danger that the nerves of our guardians may be rendered too excitable and effeminate by them. There is a real danger, he said. Then we must have no more of them. True, another and a nobler strain must be composed and sung by us, clearly. And shall we proceed to get rid of the weepings and wailings of famous men? They will go with the rest. But shall we be right in getting rid of them? Reflect. Our principle is that the good man will not consider death terrible to any other good man who is his comrade. Yes, that is our principle. And therefore he will not sorrow for his departed friend as though he had suffered anything terrible. He will not. Such an one, as we further maintain, is sufficient for himself and his own happiness, and therefore is least in need of other men. True, he said. And for this reason the loss of a son or brother, or the deprivation of fortune, is to him of all men least terrible. Assuredly. And therefore he will be least likely to lament, and will bear with the greatest equanimity any misfortune of this sort which may befall him. Yes, he will feel such a misfortune far less than another. Then we shall be right in getting rid of the lamentations of famous men, and making them over to women, and not even to women who are good for anything, or to men of a baser sort, that those who are being educated by us to be the defenders of their country may scorn to do the like. 
that will be very right then we will once more entreat homer and the other poets to depict achilles who is the son of a goddess first lying on his side then on his back and then on his face then starting up and sailing in a frenzy along the shores of the barren sea now taking the sooty ashes in both his hands and pouring them over his head or weeping and wailing in the various modes which homer has delineated nor should he describe priam the kinsman of the gods as praying and beseeching rolling in the dirt calling each man loudly by his name still more earnestly will we beg of him at all events not to introduce the gods lamenting and saying alas my misery alas that i bore the bravest to my sorrow but he must introduce the gods at any rate let him dare not so completely to misrepresent the greatest of the gods as to make him say o oh, heavens with my eyes verily i behold a dear friend of mine chased round and round the city and my heart is sorrowful or again woe is me that i am fated to have sarpedon dearest of men to me subdued at the hands of patroclus and the son of menetius for if my sweet adimantus our youth seriously listened to such unworthy representations of the gods instead of laughing at them as they ought hardly will any of them deem that he himself being but a man can be dishonoured by similar actions neither will he rebuke any inclination which may arise in his mind to say and do the like and instead of having any shame or self-control he will be always whining and lamenting on slight occasions yes he said that is most true yes i replied but that surely is what ought not to be as the argument has just proved to us and by that proof we must abide until it is disproved by a better it ought not to be neither ought our guardians to be given to laughter for a fit of laughter which has been indulged to excess almost always produces a violent reaction so i believe then persons of worth even if only mortal men must not be represented as overcome by laughter and still less must such a representation of the gods be allowed still less of the gods as you say he replied then we shall not suffer such an expression to be used against the gods as that of homer when he describes how inextinguishable laughter arose among the blessed gods when they saw hephaestus bustling about the mansion on your views we must admit them on my views if you like to father them on me that we must not admit them is certain again truth should be highly valued if as we were saying a lie is useless to the gods and useful only as a medicine to men then the use of such medicines should be restricted to physicians private individuals have no business with them clearly not he said then if any one at all is to have the privilege of lying the rulers of the state should be the persons and they in their dealings either with enemies or with their own citizens may be allowed to lie for the public good but nobody else should meddle with anything of the kind and although the rulers have this privilege for a private man to lie to them in return is to be deemed a more heinous fault than for the patient or the pupil of a gymnasium not to speak about his own bodily illnesses to the physician or to the trainer or for a sailor not to tell the captain what is happening about the ship and the rest of the crew and how things are going with himself or his fellow sailors most true he said if then the ruler catches anybody beside himself lying in the state any of the craftsmen whether he be priest or physician or carpenter he will punish him for introducing a practice which is equally subversive and destructive of ship or state most certainly he said if our idea of the state is ever carried out in the next place our youth must be temperate certainly are not the chief elements of temperance speaking generally obedience to commanders and self-control in sensual pleasures true then we shall approve such language as that of diomede in homer friend sit still and obey my word and the verses which follow the greeks marched breathing prowess in silent awe of their leaders and other sentiments of the same kind we shall 
what of this line oh heavy with wine who hast the eyes of a dog and the heart of a stag and of the words which follow would you say that these or any similar impertinences which private individuals are supposed to address to their rulers whether in verse or prose are well or ill spoken they are ill spoken they may very possibly afford some amusement but they do not conduce to temperance and therefore they are likely to do harm to our young men you would agree with me there yes and then again to make the wisest of men say that nothing in his opinion is more glorious than when the tables are full of bread and meat and the cup-bearer carries round wine which he draws from the bowl and pours into the cups is it fit or conducive to temperance for a young man to hear such words or the verse the saddest of fates is to die and meet destiny from hunger what would you say again to the tale of zeus who while other gods and men were asleep and he the only person awake lay devising plans but forgot them all in a moment through his lust and was so completely overcome at the sight of hera that he would not even go into the hut but wanted to lie with her on the ground declaring that he had never been in such a state of rapture before even when they first met one another without the knowledge of their parents or that other tale of how hephaestus because of similar goings-on cast a chain around ares and aphrodite indeed he said i am strongly of opinion that they ought not to hear that sort of thing but any deeds of endurance which are done or told by famous men these they ought to see and hear as for example what is said in the verses he smote his breast and thus reproached his heart endure my heart far worse hast thou endured certainly he said and in the next place we must not let them be receivers of gifts or lovers of money certainly not neither must we sing to them of gifts persuading gods and persuading reverend kings neither is phoenix the tutor of achilles to be approved or deemed to have given his pupil good counsel when he told him he should take the gifts of the greeks and assist them but that without a gift he should not lay aside his anger neither will we believe or acknowledge achilles himself to have been such a lover of money that he took agamemnon's gifts or that when he had received payment he restored the dead body of hector but that without payment he was unwilling to do so. Undoubtedly, he said, these are not sentiments which can be approved. Loving Homer as I do, I hardly like to say that in attributing these feelings to Achilles, or in believing that they are truly attributed to him, he is guilty of downright impiety, as little can I believe the narrative of his insolence to Apollo, where he says, thou hast wronged me o far darter most abominable of deities verily i would be even with thee if i only had the power or his insubordination to the river god on whose divinity he is ready to lay hands or his offering to the dead patroclus of his own hair which had been previously dedicated to the river god Spechaeus, and that he actually performed this vow or that he dragged hector round the tomb of patroclus and slaughtered the captives at the pyre of all this i cannot believe that he was guilty any more than i can allow our citizens to believe that he the wise chiron's pupil the son of a goddess and peleus who was the gentlest of men and third in descent from zeus was so disordered in his wits as to be at one time the slave of two seemingly inconsistent passions meanness not untainted by avarice combined with overweening contempt of gods and men you are quite right he replied and let us equally refuse to believe or allow to be repeated the tale of theseus son of poseidon or of pyrethus son of zeus going forth as they did to perpetuate a horrid rape or of any other hero or son of a god daring to do such impious and dreadful things as they falsely ascribe to them in our day and let us further compel the poets to declare either that these acts were not done by them or that they were not the sons of gods both in the same breath they shall not be permitted to affirm we will not have them trying to persuade our youth that the gods are the authors of evil and that heroes are no better than men 
sentiments which, as we were saying, are neither pious nor true, for we have already proved that evil cannot come from the gods, or surely not. And further, they are likely to have a bad effect on those who hear them, for everybody will begin to excuse his own vices when he is convinced that similar wickednesses are always being perpetrated by the kindred of the gods, the relatives of Zeus, whose ancestral altar, the altar of Zeus, is aloft in air on the peak of Ida, and who have the blood of deities yet flowing in their veins. And therefore let us put an end to such tales, lest they engender laxity of morals among the young. By all means, he replied. But now that we are determining what classes of subjects are or are not to be spoken of, let us see whether any have been omitted by us. The manner in which gods and demigods and heroes and the world below should be treated has been already laid down. Very true. And what shall we say about men? That is clearly the remaining portion of our subject. Clearly so. But we are not in a condition to answer this question at present, my friend. Why not? Because, if I am not mistaken, we shall have to say that about men, poets and storytellers are guilty of making the gravest misstatements when they tell us that wicked men are often happy, and the good miserable, and that the injustice is profitable when undetected, but that justice is a man's own loss and another's gain. These things we shall forbid them to utter, and command them to sing and say the opposite. To be sure we shall, he replied. But if you admit that I am right in this, then I shall maintain that you have implied the principle for which we have been all along contending. I grant the truth of your inference. That such things are or are not to be said about men is a question which we cannot determine until we have discovered what justice is and how naturally advantageous to the possessor, whether he seemed to be just or not. Most true, he said. Enough of the subjects of poetry. Let us now speak of the style, and when this has been considered, both matter and manner will have been completely treated. I do not understand what you mean, said Adimantus. Then I must make you understand, and perhaps I may be more intelligible, if I put the matter in this way. You are aware, I suppose, that all mythology and poetry is a narration of events, either past, present, or to come? Certainly, he replied. And narration may be either simple narration, or imitation, or a union of the two. Well, that again, he said, I do not quite understand. I fear that I must be a ridiculous teacher, when I have so much difficulty in making myself apprehended. Like a bad speaker, therefore, I will not take the whole of the subject, but will break a piece off in illustration of my meaning. You know the first lines of the Iliad, in which the poet says that Chryses prayed Agamemnon to release his daughter, and that Agamemnon flew into a passion with him, whereupon Chryses, failing of his object, invoked the anger of the god against the Achaeans. Now, as far as these lines, and he prayed all the Greeks, but especially the two sons of Atreus, the chiefs of the people, the poet is speaking in his own person. He never leads us to suppose that he is any one else. But in what follows, he takes the person of Chryses, and then he does all that he can to make us believe that the speaker is not Homer, but the aged priest himself and in this double form he has cast the entire narrative of the events which occurred at Troy and in Ithaca and throughout the Odyssey, which occurred at Troy and in Ithaca and throughout the Odyssey. Yes, and a narrative it remains both in the speeches which the poet recites from time to time and in the intermediate passages. Quite true. But when the poet speaks in the person of another, may we not say that he assimilates his style to that of a person who, as he informs you, is going to speak? Certainly. And this assimilation of himself to another, either by the use of voice or gesture, is the imitation of the person whose character he assumes? Of course. Then in this case, the narrative of the poet may be said to proceed by way of imitation? Very true. Or, 
if the poet everywhere appears and never conceals himself, then again the imitation is dropped, and his poetry becomes simple narration. However, in order that I may make my meaning quite clear, and that you may no more say, I don't understand, I will show how the change might be effected. If Homer had said, the priest came, having his daughter's ransom in his hands, supplicating the Achaeans, and above all the kings, and then, if, instead of speaking in the person of Chryses, he had continued in his own person, the words would have been not imitation, but simple narration. The passage would have run as follows. I am no poet, and therefore I drop the meter. A priest came and prayed the gods on behalf of the Greeks that they might capture Troy and return safely home, but begged that they would give him back his daughter and take the ransom which he brought and respect the god. Thus he spoke, and the other Greeks revered the priest and assented. But Agamemnon was wroth and bade him depart and not come again, lest the staff and chaplets of the god should be of no avail to him. The daughter of Chryses should not be released, he said. She should grow old with him in Argos. And then he told him to go away, and not to provoke him, if he intended to get home unscathed. And the old man went away in fear and silence, and when he had left the camp, he called upon Apollo by his many names, reminding him of everything which he had done pleasing to him, whether in building his temples or in offering sacrifice, and praying that his good deeds might be returned to him and that the Achaeans might expiate his tears by the arrows of the god, and so on. In this way the whole becomes simple narrative. I understand, he said. Or you may suppose the opposite case, that the intermediate passages are omitted and the dialogue only left. That also, he said, I understand. You mean, for example, as in tragedy. You have conceived my meaning perfectly. And if I mistake not, what you failed to apprehend before is now made clear to you, that poetry and mythology are, in some cases, wholly imitative. Instances of this are supplied by tragedy and comedy. There is likewise the opposite style, in which the poet is the only speaker. Of this the dithyram affords the best example. And the combination of both is found in epic, and in several other styles of poetry. Do I take you with me? Yes, he said. I see now what you meant. I will ask you to remember also what I began by saying, that we had done with the subject, and might proceed to the style. Yes, I remember. In saying this, I intended to imply that we must come to an understanding about the mimetic art, about the mimetic art. Whether the poets, in narrating their stories, are to be allowed by us to imitate, and, if so, whether in whole or in part, and, if the latter, in what parts, or should all imitation be prohibited? You mean, I suspect, to ask whether tragedy and comedy shall be admitted into our state? Yes, I said, but there may be more than this in question. I really do not know as yet. But whither the argument may blow, thither we go. And go we will, he said. Then, Adamantus, let me ask you whether our guardians ought to be imitators, or rather, has not this question been decided by the rule already laid down, that one man can only do one thing well, and not many, and that if he attempt many, he will altogether fail of gaining much reputation in any? Certainly. And this is equally true of imitation. No man can imitate many things as well as he would imitate a single one. He cannot. Then the same person would hardly be able to play a serious part in life, and at the same time to be an imitator and imitate many other parts as well. For even when two species of imitation are nearly allied, the same person cannot succeed in both, as, for example, the writers of tragedy and comedy. Did you not just now call them imitations? Ah, yes, I did, and you were right in thinking that the same persons cannot succeed in both, any more than they can be rhapsodists and actors at once. True. Neither are comic and tragic actors the same, yet all these things are but imitations. They are so. 
and human nature adamantus appears to have been coined into yet smaller pieces and to be as incapable of imitating many things well as of performing well the actions of which the imitations are copies quite true he replied if then we adhere to our original notion and bear in mind that our guardians setting aside every other business are to dedicate themselves wholly to the maintenance of freedom in the state making this their craft and engaging in no work which does not bear on this end they ought not to practise or imitate anything else if they imitate at all they should imitate from youth upward only those characters which are suitable to their profession the courageous temperate holy free and the like but they should not depict or be skilful at imitating any kind of illiberality or baseness lest from imitation they should come to be what they imitate did you never observe how imitations beginning in early youth and continuing far into life at length grow into habits and become a second nature affecting body voice and mind yes certainly he said then i said we will not allow those for whom we profess a care and of whom we say that they ought to be good men to imitate a woman whether young or old quarrelling with her husband or striving and vaunting against the gods in conceit of her happiness or when she is in affliction or sorrow or weeping and certainly not one who is in sickness love or labour very right he said neither must they represent slaves male or female performing the offices of slaves they must not and surely not bad men whether cowards or any others who do the reverse of what we have just been prescribing who scold or mock or revile one another in drink or out of drink or who in any other manner sin against themselves and their neighbours in word or deed as the manner of such is neither should they be trained to imitate the action or speech of men or women who are mad or bad for madness like vice is to be known but not to be practised or imitated very true he replied neither may they imitate smiths or other artificers or oarsmen or boatswains or the like how can they he said when they are not allowed to apply their minds to the callings of any of these nor may they imitate the neighing of horses the bellowing of bulls the murmur of rivers and roll of the ocean the thunder and all that sort of thing nay he said if madness be forbidden neither may they copy the behaviour of madmen you mean i said if i understand you aright that there is one sort of narrative style which may be employed by a truly good man when he has anything to say and that another sort will be used by a man of an opposite character and education and which are these two sorts he asked suppose i answered that a just and good man in the course of a narration comes on some saying or action of another good man i should imagine that he will like to personate him and will not be ashamed of this sort of imitation he will be most ready to play the part of a good man when he is acting firmly and wisely in a less degree when he is overtaken by illness or love or drink or has met with any other disaster but when he comes to a character which is unworthy of him he will not make a study of that he will disdain such a person and will assume his likeness if at all for a moment only when he is performing some good action at other times he will be ashamed to play a part which he has never practised nor will he like to fashion and frame himself after the baser models he feels the employment of such an art unless in jest to be beneath him and his mind revolts at it so i should expect he replied then he will adopt a mode of narration such as we have illustrated out of homer that is to say his style will be both imitative and narrative but there will be very little of the former and a great deal of the latter do you agree certainly he said that is the model which such a speaker must necessarily take but there is another sort of character who will narrate anything and the worse he is the more unscrupulous he will be nothing will be too bad for him and he will be ready to imitate anything not as a joke but in right good earnest and before a large company as i was just now saying 
he will attempt to represent the roll of thunder, the noise of wind and hail, or the creaking of wheels and pulleys, and the various sounds of flutes, pipes, trumpets, and all sorts of instruments. He will bark like a dog, bleat like a sheep, or crow like a cock. His entire art will consist in imitation of voice and gesture, and there will be very little narration. That, he said, will be his mode of speaking. These, then, are the two kinds of style, yes, and you would agree with me in saying that one of them is simple and has but slight changes, and if the harmony and rhythm are also chosen for their simplicity, the result is that the speaker, if he speaks correctly, is always pretty much the same in style, and he will keep within the limits of a single harmony, for the changes are not great, and in like manner he will make use of nearly the same rhythm. That is quite true he said, whereas the other requires all sorts of harmonies and all sorts of rhythms, if the music and the style are to correspond, because the style has all sorts of changes. That is also perfectly true, he replied. And do not the two styles, or the mixture of the two, comprehend all poetry and every form of expression in words? No one can say anything except in one or other of them, or in both together. They include all, he said. And shall we receive into our state all the three styles, or one only of the two unmixed styles, or would you include the mixed? I should prefer only to admit the pure imitator of virtue. Yes, I said, Adamantus, but the mixed style is also very charming, and indeed the pantomimic, which is the opposite of the one chosen by you, is the most popular style with children and their attendants, and with the world in general. I do not deny it. But I suppose you would argue that such a style is unsuitable to our state, in which human nature is not twofold or manifold, for one man plays one part only. Yes, quite unsuitable. And this is the reason why in our state, and in our state only, we shall find a shoemaker to be a shoemaker, and not a pilot also, and a husbandman to be a husbandman, and not a die-cast also, and a soldier a soldier, and not a traitor also, and the same throughout. True, he said. And therefore, when any one of these patomimic gentlemen, who are so clever that they can imitate anything, comes to us and makes a proposal to exhibit himself and his poetry, we will fall down and worship him as a sweet and holy and wonderful being, but we must also inform him that in our state such as he are not permitted to exist, the law will not allow them. And so, when we have anointed him with myrrh and set a garland of wool upon his head, we shall send him away to another city, for we mean to employ for our soul's health the rougher and severer poet or storyteller who will imitate the style of the virtuous only, and will follow those models which we prescribed at first when we began the education of our soldiers. We certainly will, he said, if we have the power. Then now, my friend, I said, that part of music or literary education which relates to the story or myth may be considered to be finished, for the matter and manner have both been discussed. I think so too he said. End of Book 3, Part 1